A while ago I made a video about what makes a mystery box story. I outlined 10 things a story needs to do to be a good mystery box. Well in this series I'm reviewing every mystery box story I know, going down the list and checking off how many they each get right. Then at the end I can give them a rating out of 10 to show how good a mystery box they are. This episode I'm checking out the anti-mystery box story, The Leftovers. The Leftovers is an HBO original series that premiered in 2014, running for three seasons. It was created by Damon Lindelof of Lost fame and Tom Parada, writer of the book the show is based on. You can easily spot the Lost influences as Lindelof pushes and innovates the original Mystery Box formula that he helped create, and in many cases he completely turns it on its head. The show is about life after a huge unexplained event where 2% of the world's population vanished or departed without a trace. This rocks the human race's perception of the world, leaving the leftover, eh, people feeling depressed and nihilistic. It follows the people of Mapleton, New York, mainly Kevin Garvey, the chief of police. Other characters include his daughter Jill, his wife Lori, who has joined the Guilty Remnant cult led by Patty Levin, and stepson Tom, who has joined the cult of the Holy Wayne. Nora Durst, a woman whose husband and two children departed, and her brother Matt, the local pastor. Let's start going down that list. Number one. Does it have a central, obvious mystery? Yes, I already said it, the departure. 2% of the population vanished into thin air, and nobody knows why. The main drive of the plot is people trying to figure out why and how this happened. Most people's first instinct is that this is the rapture, God pulling all the righteous souls into heaven. Because of those obvious similarities, religion plays a heavy role in the plot and themes. But there are plenty of departed people who weren't Christian, or even good people. In fact, it seems like the people chosen for departure were completely random. The Pope, I get the Pope, but Gary f***ing Busey? Since the world's major religions offered no satisfying explanations for what happened, people abandoned them en masse for favor of various cults. There are also organizations that attempt to find scientific explanations for the departure, mostly in the form of the Department of Sudden Departure for which Nora works. They go around interviewing friends and family of the departed to collect data on them all in hopes of finding a pattern but they don't. It only further confirms the idea that the departures were indeed random. Number two, does the show have more than one mystery? Yes. Besides the departure, there are plenty of other questions raised throughout the show. Here are a few from season one. First, there's the guilty remnant, a cult. We're properly introduced to them for the first time when they show up at a memorial for the departed holding signs that spill out, don't waste your breath. The show takes a while to explain what exactly their beliefs are, but eventually we come to understand that they believe that the world effectively ended when the departure happened, and that everything afterwards is meaningless. They've dedicated themselves to making the rest of the world realize it. In addition to that, they're clearly planning something throughout Season 1, but we don't know what. The other major cult in the show is the cult of the Holy Wayne. Wayne can apparently take away grief and pain by touching people, but is he really holy, or are his powers just a placebo? And a few other miscellaneous mysteries. Kevin's dad is locked in a psych ward because he hears voices that tell him to do things. Again, is he crazy or are they real? On the same days of the departure, apparently all dogs in the world went feral for some reason. And there's a guy driving around shooting them all. These mysteries, though, are not structured in the traditional mystery box way. I called the show the anti-mystery box story at the beginning of the video. As I summarize the rest of the show, you'll see why. The season 1 finale finally shows us the Guilty Remnant's plan. They break into every house in Mapleton to replace every departed with a creepy mannequin that looks like them. The townspeople, in their grief, attack the guilty remnant and burn down their houses. In the chaos, Jill almost dies, and this shocks Lori into leaving the GR for good. Kevin officially gets together with Nora, and they adopt Lily, Holy Wayne's baby that Tom left on their porch. After the horrors that happened in Mapleton, they all move to Miracle, Texas, a town where nobody departed. We don't know if there's something special about the town or if it was just random chance that nobody departed. Either way though, it has since become a hugely popular place to move, as people come there searching for some kind of meaning in this miserable world. There are hundreds of people camped outside in hopes of getting in one day. The Garveys get lucky and buy a house next to the Murphy family. 
The Murphys are respected town leaders, although the dad, John, has a side hobby of beating the crap out of anybody who claims to have supernatural powers. This brings him into conflict with Matt, who brings his catatonic wife to Miracle to help her heal, and it seems to work. We don't know whether it was a result of the town's power or a coincidence. The day after the Garbies move in, the Murphy's daughter Evie goes missing, and at the same time, Kevin wakes up next to their empty car after sleepwalking. This starts a town-wide search for Evie, while Kevin wonders if he might have done something to Evie while he was sleepwalking. But it turns out that Evie disappeared voluntarily. She went to join the Guilty Remnant, and busts through the bridge that keeps Miracle closed off to let all the people from the outside charge in. But then, oh, oh by the way, the US government treats cult members as basically subhuman with no rights, so the military sends a missile to blow up Evie and the GR. That's where Season 2 leaves off. With all of that in mind, let's check out the next few criteria. The mysteries and the leftovers are not connected. Sure, they're connected thematically, but plot-wise they're distinctly separate from one another. A mystery box story should have mysteries that build on each other. Every time a question is answered, that answer should raise another question, eventually weaving together different mysteries that appeared unrelated at first. In the leftovers, a question is raised, and then it's answered, and it stops there. The mysteries are known, and the show is long enough to develop them all, but there's no progression in the mystery. The questions don't build to any bigger understanding of the story world. And most notably, none of the smaller mysteries give us any hints about the initial big mystery. The usual mystery box story way of doing things is to have a big overall mystery, medium-sized mysteries over the course of a season or so, and small mysteries explored over a couple of episodes. All the small and medium questions add up, their answers giving us pieces of the answer to the big question. But by the final episodes, we're still as clueless about the departure as we were in episode 1. So no, the reels aren't well paced because there's nothing to pace. Does this all make The Leftovers a bad mystery box? Well, yes and no. This is where things get really interesting to talk about. The Leftovers might be unsuccessful as a mystery box, but that's on purpose. It's a critique of the very idea of a mystery box, and every storytelling decision it makes is directly counter to something like Lost. What does that mean? Well, if you listen to me list all the main mysteries in the first few seasons, you might have noticed a pattern. Basically, every question boils down to, is this a supernatural thing, or does it have a logical explanation? Is Wayne holy or a fraud? Was Miracle a blessed place, or was it random chance that no one departed there? When Matt's wife wakes up in Miracle, was that a coincidence? Did Evie depart, or was she kidnapped? But here's the thing. Every single time a question gets an answer, it ends up being something super mundane. Like here in the first episode, there's this guy driving around shooting feral dogs. Kevin tries telling other people about him, but nobody believes him. The show is clearly hinting at the idea that Kevin is imagining him. But, nope. A few episodes later, he shows up in front of a group of people and says hi. His name's Dean and he's not imaginary, he's just some weirdo who lives on the edge of town. Wayne fails to take away Nora's pain. And Tom lies about inheriting Wayne's power and is able to produce the exact same effects. These both heavily suggest that Wayne never had any real powers. Some characters suggest that Evie's disappearance might have been a delayed departure, but no, she left of her own accord. And the show takes great pains to show that people are stupid for thinking Miracle is anything special. This show punishes you for asking questions, because every answer is boring and anticlimactic. This all feeds into the show's main theme. Just like we pick apart all the weird things we see on screen to find answers, most of the characters are trying to find answers as to why the departure happened. Plenty of people have different theories. Maybe God did it, or the world ended, or it's a matter of geography, or certain people are lenses that make people near them disappear. But none of these ideas hold water. People are grasping at straws for any explanation and nobody gets anywhere close to proving or disproving any of them. But even if somebody did figure out why the departure happened, it wouldn't matter. Because it's not just pure curiosity that drives the characters to look for answers. The departure shattered whatever sense of purpose anybody had. The people trying to explain the departure are doing so to fill a hole within themselves and bring meaning back into their lives. But it won't work. If you sell us your house, we'll be one step closer to answering that. Then what? Sorry? If you're right, then what? What does it matter? Learning what caused the departure won't make you happy. No answer will be satisfying. To make sure the audience understands this, the show constantly undermines its smaller mysteries by making its explanations so boring. It puts you in a situation similar to these characters, so you can understand how futile their search and your search for answers is. This is best exemplified in episode 6, Guest. In this episode, Nora goes to a work conference, but somebody took her name badge. Then later, the conference almost kicks her out because somebody has been running around with her badge, getting drunk and breaking things. 
This has all the makings of a typical mystery box plotline. It gets you excited about the possible answers. Did somebody really steal her badge? If so, why? Or is Nora getting blackout drunk and forgetting what she's doing? Or is it some even bigger conspiracy? But nope. Soon after, we find out that somebody really was impersonating Nora, and it was just to promote the lamest departure theory in the whole show. I am not Nora Durst. The questionnaires are sent to incinerators outside of Tallahassee, Florida. Their benefit payments are a way to silence us all. In 2005, Israeli Mossad was an The characters won't ever find a satisfying answer to the departure, and we won't ever find a satisfying answer to the show's mystery box. The best way to go about your life is to follow the advice of the season 2 theme song. Think out just, let the mystery be. Let the mystery be. Stop asking questions, you'll only be disappointed. The show beats you over the head with that message. But are we gonna stop asking questions? No, no we're not. For a lot of us, the questions are the biggest reason we watch. They're probably why you clicked on this video in the first place. We can't help ourselves. And that brings us to the second part of this show's brilliant subversion of the mystery box. Every other little mystery is disappointing, but there's one other huge mysterious thing that needs addressing. You probably noticed in my summary that I skipped over one major, major plotline. The fact that Kevin Garvey dies and comes back to life multiple times. Here's what happens. Kevin sleepwalks. But it's not the usual kind of sleepwalking. To the people who run into him, he seems totally awake and alert. They call it sleepwalking for lack of a better term, but it's more like he has some kind of mental illness that causes it, or he's possessed. Whatever it is, it's not normal to walk around a town fully lucid and then not remember any of what you did. I mean, we all forget things. Like, sometimes I watch old videos of mine, even recent ones, and go, huh, I don't remember writing that. But what's happening to him is basically impossible. While in this state, Kevin kidnaps Patty, out of anger at the guilty remnant for taking his wife away. Although we don't see this happen. Kevin wakes up with Patty in a secluded cabin and is distraught at what he's done. He tries to convince Patty to forgive him and put the incident behind them, but instead, Patty kills herself. On his way back home though, Kevin starts seeing an apparition of Patty. Patty hangs around him for most of season 2. He tries to ignore her, but she won't go away, and it takes a serious toll on his mental health. On the night Evie disappears, Kevin wakes up from sleepwalking at the bottom of a drained lake, with a weight tied to his waist, next to Evie's abandoned car. We don't see it, the implication is that he tried to kill himself while sleepwalking, but when he jumped in the lake, it drained somehow. Later we find out why he jumped. Michael Murphy takes him to his grandfather Virgil. Virgil explains that to get rid of Patty, Kevin has to die and do battle with her on the other side. Virgil had actually told him this already, but it was during the second sleepwalk. This is why Kevin jumped in the lake, he was following Virgil's instructions. This time Kevin drinks poison, and this time it does kill him. He wakes up in a weird alternate reality, where he's an assassin in a hotel who has to kill Patty. This is some of the coolest, weirdest stuff in the show. But to summarize, it doesn't go the way he thinks, but he does kill Patty, and wakes back up in the real world with Patty gone. Holy shit. Not long after, John finds out that Kevin knew more about Evie's disappearance than he was letting on, and shoots him. Kevin dies, goes back to the hotel, and wakes up again. This stuff comes dangerously close to breaking rule number 7, be clear whether the mysteries are diegetic. But the show makes sure to ground it all. Kevin has multiple conversations with multiple people about everything that happened. This isn't some kind of elaborate visual metaphor. It really happened. It is all diegetic. And here's where The Leftovers exploits their need for answers. Everything else in the show has a mundane explanation. For the first season and a half, the show has been teaching you that nothing is supernatural, even if it seems like it is at first. Some of this stuff can be chalked up to Kevin losing his mind, but coming back from the dead? That has to be something more. The other characters seem to think so too. In season 3, some of them start treating him like a religious figure. And I mean that literally. Matt writes a holy book about him. I shot you in the chest, and you got up and walked back into town. You try to drown yourself, and an earthquake saved your life. You drank poison. I buried you and you went to the other place. It came back. Up until this point, the audience was able to view all the various belief systems in the show from an objective distance. Every character is looking for answers about the departure. Some of them turn to religion, some join cults, some turn to science, and some come up with conspiracy theories. From our vantage point, though, 
we're shown that many of these approaches, if not all of them, are wrong. They're futile and flawed. The show has taught us that this line of thinking is foolish by poking huge holes in their theories at every opportunity. But now, when we see Matt, John, and Michael create their own religion around Kevin, everything we've seen so far makes it seem more believable, not less. As far as we can see, they're right. And suddenly we find ourselves in the same position as every other believer in the show. We think that everyone else is wrong and stupid, but we know the truth. We know what's really going on. Even after getting told to stop hoping for answers, we're lured into believing that this might be what we were looking for. Before we get to the ending, let's go through some tropes. This show definitely has fewer mystery box cliches than most. First, for the shady organization with unclear motives, we have the Guilty Remnant. There is no literal mystery box, and no time travel. There is a non-linear timeline in the form of extended flashbacks. As for the guy who speaks in riddles, maybe Virgil falls under this category, but I think the best fit is this guy, David Burton. He appears in the Afterlife Hotel and talks with Kevin a few times. And later we meet him in the real world, where he claims to be God. It seems like he knows something we don't, but he never tells us anything outside of a few vague clues. How does this show end? And how much does it wrap up? Going into season 3, the audience isn't really expecting an explanation for the departure. The show has made it loud and clear that hoping for that is futile. But we were expecting some kind of conclusion regarding Kevin's immortality. The main conflict of this season is the upcoming 7th anniversary of the departure. Since the number 7 is important in the Bible, most people are convinced that something huge is going to happen on that date. And everyone has a theory as to what that might be and what they need to do beforehand. Kevin Garvey Sr., for example, believes he has to perform a series of aboriginal rain rituals to avert a great flood. Meanwhile, Nora investigates a group of people who claim to have a machine that sends people to wherever the departed people go. At first, she assumes it's a scam and sets out to expose them, but she gets drawn into the idea and becomes obsessed with trying the machine for herself to see her departed family again. She and Kevin travel to Australia to check it out. In the second to last episode, Nora gets in the machine and disappears. John, Matt, and Michael believe that Kevin needs to be in Miracle for the 7th anniversary, so they chase him down to bring him back. Through them, we continually get fed the narrative that Kevin is some kind of messiah. But finally, inevitably, we get the first signs that Kevin's powers aren't as magical as we thought. He sees Evie in a news broadcast and chases her down to talk to her, asking her how she's still alive. He has a whole conversation with Evie about how she's in hiding and won't come back home. But when he takes a picture of her and sends it to Lori, this happens. I need you to pull up that photo you sent me. Look at the photo again. This whole thing culminates in the second to last episode, where a bunch of characters get together to drown Kevin and send him to the other side for a few fetch quests. We get our final hotel sequence, and he does talk to everyone he's supposed to, but in the end, it doesn't amount to much. In this other world, the guilty remnant nukes everything. Kevin wakes up, the 7th anniversary passes by, and nothing happens. In the final episode, we see an old Nora living in Australia taking care of some birds. Then, old Kevin shows up at her doorstep. We get one final mystery box fake out, as Kevin apparently doesn't remember her. But then we learn that he was lying, and that he was pretending not to know Nora because he felt awkward about how they left things. But then we get something no one was expecting an actual answer to where the departed people went. Nora tells the story of how she went through the machine. She came out the other side to find another world just like ours, only emptier. As she explored, she discovered that all the departed people are here. In Nora's world, they lost 2% of the population. In this other world, they lost 98%. With so few people left, society's in shambles. And Nora's husband is happily remarried. Her family has moved on. So Nora tracked down the guy who made the machine and had him send her back. With this final reveal, The Leftovers subverts her expectations one last time. It gives us a real answer to its big question. And of course, it's the worst, least meaningful answer it could give. How soul-crushing is this? To find out that after years of grief and suffering because your loved ones disappeared, that they're alive, but they're way worse off than you are. And it still doesn't explain why it happened, just that it happened. 
Nora ignored her own advice. She didn't let the mystery be, and got an answer that could only make her feel worse about the whole thing. It didn't fix her ennui and lack of purpose. So, The Leftovers gives an unexpected reveal to its final question. But there's still a lot left up in the air, mainly about Kevin and his immortality. We never find out what the deal was with his powers, or this other side he went to. I wouldn't say that the story wraps up enough to be a satisfying mystery box ending. But the ending was set up in advance, if not plot-wise then definitely thematically. It's what I've been saying this whole video. The ending left some things open, and some had massive letdown answers. It all feeds into the theme that not everything has a satisfying conclusion. There is no doubt though, that it has great characters. Sometimes mystery box stories push character development to the side, but The Leftovers heavily prioritizes characters over mysteries. The show is all about regular people dealing with day-to-day -day life after such a cataclysmic event. It makes us feel their complete range of emotions. Grief, joy, despair, love. In particular, I want to highlight Matt. His role in the main plot is minor compared to some of the other characters, but each season has one episode that's focused entirely on him, and those episodes are some of the tightest ones in the series. Matt's a priest, a role model to his friends, and his devotion to his religion is unwavering to the outside observer. But get up close, and you can see his weakness, his vices, insecurities, and mistakes. Before the video ends, here are some of my favorite moments from the show. Lori beating up her publisher. What I don't know, Lori, and what I need to know is how you feel about it. This gut-wrenching flashback where we see the departed with their loved ones, and Nora is not appreciative of her family at all. Table. Young Patty in the hotel. Would it help if I close my eyes? Would it help if I say I deserve it? That's not true. I'm stupid. I'm worthless. I'm a fat pig. I don't know how to be happy. Please stop. Okay. Would it help if... And Kevin Garvey Sr. falling off a roof. Remember, we've got a deal! <laughs> The Leftovers takes on the form of a mystery box story to draw in those who love Lost and others like it, and then inverts the mystery box formula entirely. It shortchanges you out of the answers you're hoping for, and in the process, it makes you totally okay with that. The Leftovers gets a final mystery box rating of 7 out of 10. <laughs>